Hi everybody, I'm Chris Morosky. The title of this video is Gestational Diabetes, and it is part of our Basic Science Conference video series. The goals and objectives of this video are as follows. Discuss the workup and management of a patient presenting with gestational diabetes. Review prenatal genetic screening options. Discuss sleep disturbances in pregnancy. And describe in detail the basic science pathophysiology of gestational diabetes. We'll begin this video by meeting our patient, IH. IH is a 36-year-old Dominican-American G4P1021 who presents for a routine follow-up prenatal visit at 28 weeks and 3 days. Her main complaint is poor sleep. She wakes 3 to 4 times at night and she has to avoid each time she wakes up. What are the routine parts of her prenatal care that you would want to review in her chart prior to seeing her today? What specific follow-up questions do you have about her poor sleep and her previous pregnancies? Again, just like all of the videos in our basic science conference series, these are prenatal patients and they're coming in for a brief 15-minute office visit. Your interview, physical exam, and presentation should be much more concise compared to the intake in history and physical that you'll do for new OB patients and for women admitted in labor on labor and delivery. In this video, we will briefly cover a routine part of prenatal care called genetic screening. Genetic screening consists of different mechanisms to screen for aneuploidy in pregnancy. The most common aneuploidy screened for are trisomy 21, 18, 13, and monosomy X, also known as Turner syndrome. When thinking about prenatal genetic screening, it can get broken down into mechanisms that are offered in the first trimester and those offered in the second trimester. In the first trimester, an ultrasound can be performed to measure the fetal nucleotranslucency. This is a specific measurement on the back of the baby's neck performed at 11 to 13 weeks gestation. Increased thickness of the nuchal fold is associated with an increased risk of aneuploidy. Around the same time, maternal serum can be drawn for two hormones that also can be used as screening. They are PAP-A, or pregnancy-associated plasma protein A, and free beta HCG. Patients can also have cell-free fetal DNA screening performed as early as eight weeks. Cell-free fetal DNA has the benefits of being more sensitive, being offered earlier in pregnancy, and they can detect the presence of a Y chromosome so patients can find out the sex of the fetus. It is important to keep in mind that cell-free fetal DNA is not 100% sensitive or specific, and this therefore is still a screening test. In the second trimester, the traditional quad screen is still available to patients. This is available from approximately 15 to 20 weeks. The four hormones checked in the quad screen include alpha fetoprotein, estriol, HCG, and inhibin. Please see our pregnancy termination video for a helpful chart reviewing lab values for these different quad screen tests and their association with aneuploidy. Patients in the second trimester still are able to have cell-free fetal DNA. In fact, there is a higher fraction of cell-free fetal DNA as the pregnancy progresses along. Finally, patients are offered a fetal ultrasound at 18 to 22 weeks to review the anatomy of the fetus. Based on the findings of this ultrasound, the risk of aneuploidy can be adjusted for either the quad screen or serum screening testing. Also, it is important to note that alpha fetal protein alone is a screening test for open neural tube defects and this test can be performed from 15 to 22 weeks. For patients who have low risk first and second trimester screening tests, alpha fetal protein alone is still recommended to screen for spina bifida and other open neural tube defects. Other important aspects of routine prenatal care are covered in our preeclampsia and third trimester bleeding basic science conference videos. All right, we have a little transition here to poor sleep and sleep hygiene. For patients presenting with poor sleep, it is important to cover these review of systems with them. Are they having trouble falling asleep or staying asleep? You would want to quantify with them how many hours they sleep and how many hours they are awake each day. It is often very important for them to keep a sleep diary. You should question the patient about napping during the day. You should also question the patient about sleepiness during the day. There should also be some investigation into nocturnal disturbances such as children, pets, and technology. There are many medications that can cause changes in sleep. A thorough review of the patient's medication list is indicated. Finally, you'll want to ask them questions about sleep hygiene. 
what is sleep hygiene? Well, let's take a look. It's very important to have a routine bedtime that patients sleep to, even on the weekends and days off from work or school. It is important for patients to sleep when they're sleepy. Getting in bed when you're not sleepy can be anxiety provoking and worsen the poor sleep. I like the term conducive bedroom, but this means a dark room with normal temperature and no bright lights or distractions. Consideration should be given to avoiding too much food, caffeine, alcohol, or smoking in the two to three hours prior to bedtime. Also, screen time should end approximately one hour prior to bedtime. All right, with that, here are the follow-up questions that you should ask this patient about her poor sleep and previous pregnancies. You would want to briefly review her histories, paying particular attention to her previous obstetric and gynecologic histories. You would want to review the poor sleep review of systems and sleep hygiene questions. You would also want to ask review of systems questions related to possible urinary tract infection. And you would want to ask review of systems questions related to her personal risk for diabetes. Here are our pertinent positives for our patient IH. On further HPI and review of systems, the patient reports no dysuria or hematuria. She is drinking more water during the day and right before bedtime. She is eating the same amount. She has no trouble falling asleep. She has not taken any sleep aids. She reports positive fetal movement, negative bleeding, contractions, or leakage of fluid. These questions should be asked for every prenatal patient at every encounter. Her review of her prenatal care so far reviews normal initial labs with normal pap cytology and a negative HPV. She had normal first and second trimester ultrasound with negative NIPT and AFP. She has not had a glucola or her 28-week labs yet. In her history, she has one prior term normal spontaneous vaginal delivery of a 9-pound, 2-ounce baby with no complications or diabetes. She had one prior spontaneous abortion and one prior elective abortion, both with dilation and suction carotage and no complications. Her only medical problem is obesity, and her only surgeries are the dilation and suction curatage, as mentioned. She's a never smoker and homemaker. Her family history is significant for a mother and older sister who had gestational diabetes in their pregnancies. What part of the physical exam would you want to perform today? Again, keep in mind this is a routine prenatal visit and you only have about 15 minutes to get the patient in and out of the office. The part of the physical exam that you would want to perform today are vital signs and general appearance, a urine dipstick, fetal heart tones, and fundal height measurement. All right, so let's see the physical exam for our patient IH. On physical exam, her vital signs, she is five feet six inches tall and 212 pounds. Her blood pressure is 121 over 78, heart rate 88, respiratory rate 18, temperature 97.9 degrees Fahrenheit. Urine dipstick is one plus ketones, negative white blood cells, trace protein, and two plus glucose. On general appearance, she's alert, oriented, no apparent distress. Her fundal height is 33 centimeters. The fetal heart tones are 122 beats per minute. All right, based on her presentation and these physical exam findings, what additional testing would you want to order? This patient is presenting for a routine prenatal visit at 28 weeks. Overall, her only and concerning exam finding is her fundal height of 33 centimeters at 28 weeks, so this is definitely size greater than dates. We would want to consider an ultrasound to measure the size of the baby as well as the amniotic fluid. Also important to remember, the patient should have her glucola screening 28-week labs performed today, and we need to begin to think about and offer her vaccines such as Tdap, influenza if indicated and not already received, and if she's Rh negative, she would need Rogam at this visit. In summary, the additional testing that you would want to order includes a second or third trimester ultrasound. For details on what fetal biometry and amniotic fluid index measurements look like, please see our preeclampsia video. She would want to have her glucola challenge. At the same time, you would check a CBC, RPR, and HIV. These are routine. And as mentioned earlier, she would be offered the Tdap, influenza, and Rogam injections as indicated. All right, so let's go on and see the results of the further workup for our patient IH. On transabdominal ultrasound, she is found to have a viable singleton intrauterine pregnancy in the transverse presentation. The fetal heart tones are 135 beats per minute. She has a grade 2 posterior placenta with no previa. Her biometry growth measurements are as follows. Head circumference, 32 weeks, 1 day. Biparietal diameter, 31 weeks and 4 days. Abdominal circumference, 34 weeks and 1 day. Femur length, 30 weeks and 3 days. The adjusted ultrasound age is 32 weeks and 3 days. 
and this puts the baby at greater than the 90th percentile for its current gestational age. The amniotic fluid assessment reveals quadrant 1, 4.2 centimeters, quadrant 2, 5.6 centimeters, quadrant 3, 5.7 centimeters, quadrant 4, 6.1 centimeters, with a total amniotic fluid index of 21.6 centimeters. Her glucola screening test value is 208 milligrams per deciliter. Her HIV and RPR are negative, her hemoglobin is 10.5, and her hematocrit is 31.1%. Giving her severely elevated glucose value, this patient can be diagnosed right away with gestational diabetes. She does not need to go on into a three-hour oral glucose challenge. What we will do in the next few slides is review the pathophysiologic process of how gestational diabetes affects the baby. The basic science question that you're being asked to answer is as follows. Diagram maternal insulin glucose and gestational diabetes and how they can affect the growth of the baby and cause hypoglycemia at birth. In this first side, we see the maternal fetal unit with the mom on the left, the human placenta in the middle, and the baby on the right. The human placenta produces increasing amounts of human placental lactogen, also called somatomamotropin. It also produces other hormones which play a role here. These include estrogen, progesterone, and various other hormones. When mom eats food and there's an increase in serum glucose, the pancreas secretes insulin, and the insulin helps drive the glucose into the peripheral cells. Due to the effects of human placental lactogen and the other hormones, there is an increasing insulin resistance in pregnancy. Therefore, glucose is elevated and is able to cross through the human placenta over to the baby. Very importantly, the maternal insulin does not cross across the human placenta to the baby. The baby has a totally normal, beautiful new pancreas, and as glucose values increase, it responds by increasing its insulin production. In the setting of gestational diabetes, as maternal glucose becomes more elevated, so too does the baby's serum glucose. The fetal pancreas responds by creating even more insulin and over time, with increasing chronic hyperglycemia, islet cell hyperplasia occurs, and the fetal pancreas is now secreting large amounts of insulin into the baby. Increased levels of serum insulin in the baby cause the following. Insulin promotes lipogenesis in the liver and the peripheral fat. Insulin inhibits lipolysis in the peripheral fat. Insulin also increases glycogen synthesis in the liver and insulin increases protein synthesis. Through all these actions, and with the function of insulin as a growth factor, this causes growth of the baby. Very importantly, the baby grows centrally, and there is a central adiposity, just like syndrome X or metabolic syndrome in adults. This is why these babies are at increased risk for shoulder dystocia at time of delivery. Not only are these babies larger, they're also larger in their abdomen. The head delivers, but the shoulders and abdomen can get stuck at time of delivery. In terms of the neonatal hypoglycemia, for the postpartum baby, the human placenta is removed and glucose levels in the baby return to normal. Unfortunately, the islet cell hyperplasia takes days to weeks to resolve, and so the pancreas is still creating increased amounts of insulin. In the absence of maternal hyperglycemia and the continued elevated levels of neonatal insulin, the neonate is at risk for hypoglycemia. These babies need to have their sugars monitored closely, and often these babies need to go to special care nurseries to be provided IV glucose infusions. All right, that basic science wasn't too much, and I think it was pretty understandable. Let's move on to propose a management for this patient, IH. With IH's newly diagnosed gestational diabetes, the first approach is to recommend diet and exercise. There's no specific pregnancy diet, but portion control is key. For these patients, reducing carbohydrates is probably important. All pregnant patients are recommended to get 20 to 30 minutes of moderate exercise two to three times per week. A discussion with IH around her current diet and exercise would be helpful in setting diet and exercise goals for the next two weeks. There's a lot of discussion about weight loss in pregnancy. Most studies show that attention to diet, exercise, and mild weight loss can greatly affect the hyperglycemia of gestational diabetes in pregnancy. At this point, it's very important for IH to start checking her finger stick blood sugars. In pregnancy, we ask women to check their blood sugars fasting in the morning and two hours postprandial for each meal. This ends up being a total of four finger sticks performed each day. 
the goal values are a fasting glucose in the morning less than 90 and two hour postprandial glucose values less than 120. For patients who have continued elevated blood sugars despite diet and exercise, they are then started on insulin. Traditionally, patients will be started on MPH at night, then twice daily, and then after that they're started on regular insulin around their meals. But new research shows that these are not nearly as effective at preventing neonatal hypoglycemia as insulin. Since patients with gestational diabetes are at risk for accelerated growth of the baby and fetal macrosomia, they will undergo monthly growth ultrasounds. Patients will also need to begin non-stress tests. Based on her finger stick blood sugars and the results of the ultrasounds, this would either begin as early as 28 weeks and more commonly at 32 weeks. There is some increased risk of fetal demise at term for patients with gestational diabetes. Due to that, patients are recommended to have an induction prior to their due date. This can occur between 37 to 39 weeks and again is usually based on finger stick blood sugars and the results of the growth ultrasounds. Since there is a risk for shoulder dystocia and birth trauma at the time of delivery, cesarean section is offered to patients with an estimated fetal weight greater than 4,500 grams on their growth ultrasounds. With good attention to diet and exercise, regular monitoring of finger stick glucose, insulin is needed, and follow-up, most mothers with gestational diabetes will have a successful delivery and a healthy neonate. All right, everybody, that is the end of this video. Let's go over our goals and objectives and see how we did. Discuss the workup and management of a patient presenting with gestational diabetes. Review prenatal genetic screening options. Discuss sleep disturbances in pregnancy. And describe in detail the basic science and pathophysiology of gestational diabetes. Yep, good job. Got that all in with this video. Thanks so much for watching. Good luck with your studies, and we'll see you around. Bye bye.